Much like the cliffs in this Monet painting, trust can erode over time. Something that took a long time to form can come crashing down in one fierce storm. And this erosion is why I decided to talk about trust in science today. As a scientist, this matters to me. Like any complex topic, trust is best examined from multiple perspectives. So certainly I'll do my best today to try to present and distill a variety of scholarship from a variety of people in a variety of fields, such as those listed here. Before I go any further, let's define trust. Specifically, trust in experts and institutions, because trust in family and friends is a little bit different. So trust in experts and institutions is often defined as this, the willingness to accept vulnerability based on positive expectations of trustworthiness. So we rely on people, we depend on them, those who we deem to be worthy, trustworthy. The article I cite here, I think, does a fantastic job of reviewing the literature on the topic of trust, and even articles published since then have highlighted these two dimensions of trust, which I underlined here. This is emphasis I put in. So let's, do, let's um, apply this definition of trust to trust in science specifically. We rely on scientists and scientific institutions and expect them to be trustworthy sources of information about the natural world, the object of their study. And know what you're thinking. Both of these definitions mention trustworthy, trustworthiness, so now let's define that. Researchers often arrive at these three dimensions of trustworthiness. Competence, knowledge, skills, experience. Benevolence, care, kindness, good intentions. And integrity honesty, humility, reliability, and morals. So let's ask the question, does science, its scientists, its scientific institutions display these elements of trustworthiness, competence, benevolence, and integrity? Well, I could spend a lot of time talking about the competence, the years of study, the exams, defenses, and the skills acquired along the way. I could so too talk about scientists and institutions and their volunteerism, their advocacy, their caring efforts. I could also spend a lot of time talking about the integrity we see in the peer review process, the ethical standards and procedures in place such as disclosure of conflicts of interest. But instead of sharing facts and statistics about these, today I'll actually share with you some stories. Stories of scientists that I think display competence, benevolence, and integrity. I could share stories of amazing scientists in any discipline, but today I decided to focus on one discipline in particular, and that is pharmaceutical science. So let me tell you a little bit about this scientist, Dr. Kizmekia Corbett. She spent several years at the National Institute of Health Vaccine Research Center in the United States, where she led a team that applied their knowledge in genetics and virology to design the mRNA that was then included in their collaborator, Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Corbett is now an assistant professor of immunology and infectious disease at Harvard. And when she's not researching there, she's mentoring youth, advocating for science education, promoting vaccine awareness in underserved communities. During this pandemic, Dr. Corbett frequently volunteered her time to discuss science, race, and her Christian faith, among other topics. A Washington Post article that interviewed her that was published in August 2020 included this quote. She said, my religion tells me why I should want to help people, make the world a better place. Science shows me how. Science shows me how to study the coronavirus and do the work that one day, hopefully, will prevent people from dying of COVID-19." End quote. Let me tell you about some other scientists, Dr. Aslam Terechi and Dr. Urher Shahin. This is a married couple who co-founded the company BioNTech in Germany. Terechi is on the left, she is the chief medical officer, and Shahin, he is on the right, he is the CEO. On the day they were married, like many scientists, they returned to the lab and kept working. <laughs> Shahin is an immigrant from Turkey, and he became friends with an executive at Pfizer who was from Greece. And despite their home countries being quite antagonistic toward each other, these two scientists found friendship and peace. And we know that this collaboration, this dream team of Pfizer and BioNTech, brought the first COVID-19 vaccine to the world. 
In response to a question about this vaccine, Shahin said, there are not too many companies on the planet which have the capacity and the competence to do it as fast as we could do it. So it felt not like an opportunity, but a duty, end quote. When you listen to interviews of this wife and husband science team, and I've watched lots, you can tell pretty quickly that for sure they're intelligent, but they're also soft-spoken, humble, patient, kind. Let me tell you about one more scientist, Dr. Peter Cullis. He was born in England and he spent the majority of his life here in Canada. Dr. Cullis is a physicist and biochemist working at the University of British Columbia. His team developed lipid nanoparticles used in treatment for rare diseases and also for vaccines. In fact, his team developed the lipid nanoparticles used in the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. He's published over 300 scientific articles, is an inventor on over 30 patents, and he's co-founded and served on the board of over 10 different pharmaceutical companies. He's done a lot. When I look at Dr. Cullis, I see someone who is a dreamer, someone who is creative, caring, brilliant. I see someone who knows that with basic biological research, like the research he's done in lipids and membranes, you simply never know what will end up being useful and helpful. You just have to keep working and persevering. In a recent interview, he discussed the huge possibilities of treating and curing diseases, and he concluded by saying, with regards to what's next, if there is one thing life has taught me, it's that there's no time like the present to try to achieve impossible dreams, end quote. Sure, not all scientists are this amazing, but it's really easy to find stories like these, really easy to find stories of scientists that display the competence, benevolence, and integrity that I think these four individuals display. In the second half of my talk, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and share some lessons that I've learned and that you too can learn by picking up these four books about trust in science. Some of these books look at trust in experts more generally and simply use science as an example of expertise, and some of them look at trust in science quite specifically. I chose these books because they're all written by well-trained scholars who are part of institutions that hold them accountable, and they all do a fantastic job of citing peer-reviewed scholarship, so it's quite easy for you to double-check their claims and do further reading. First up, a book which some of you may recognize, quite popular, Why Trust Science by Dr. Naomi Oreskes. Dr. Oreskes is a geologist turned science historian. She's a professor of history and affiliated professor of earth and planetary sciences at Harvard. In her book, she argues that science is trustworthy because of its diverse methods and diverse people, diverse scientists. She often quotes the philosopher Helen Longineau, who argues that in diversity, there is epistemic strength. Our epistemology, our ways of knowing are strong when we incorporate many methods, many people, many ways of thinking. The second book here, Denying to the Grave, Why We Ignore the Facts That Will Save Us, by Drs. Sarah and Jack Gorman. Dr. Sarah Gorman is a public health special specialist, and Dr. Jack Gorman is a, uh, was a psychiatrist, and he was a professor of psychiatry at Columbia for 21 years. In their book, they argue that there are many reasons why people ignore medical science, reasons such as conspiracy theories and charismatic leaders, but also simple discomfort with uncertainty and probability, and many more reasons. But ultimately, they sum it up as our human nature. We are human, and public health strategies must take this into account in their educational efforts. This third book, Vaccine Hesitancy, Public Trust, Expertise, and the War on Science by Dr. Maya Goldenberg. Dr. Goldenberg is a philosophy professor at the University of Guelph. She argues that there is an underappreciation for how trust pervades science, its institutions, and its relations with the community. She argues that trust in science is central. Like philosophers do, Goldenberg offers many critical and logical reasons for why we must trust experts, including scientists. She argues that there's simply too much knowledge in the world for any one person to know. If we didn't rely on experts, like expert plumbers and pilots and pastors and pharmacists, well then society would simply come to a standstill. I know I can't live my life without experts like these and others. No one person can do it all, it's simply not feasible. 
And this last book, Redeeming Expertise, Scientific Trust and the Future of the Church by Dr. Josh Reeves. Dr. Reeves is director of the Samford Center for Science and Religion. Trained as a theologian, he explores church history and church practice and doctrine and just has a lot of wisdom to share with us. He explained that since the Reformation removed the hierarchy of church authorities, since then the modern age has extended this to all areas of life. We people take this idea that we don't need anyone to intercede on our behalf and apply it to life more generally and say, we don't need anybody to do anything on our behalf. We don't need any experts. We can do it ourselves. We can DIY. He also argues that the intellectual role of the Holy Spirit becomes a potent theme in the anti-expert mentality that we see in some Christian communities. Why trust corruptible people when you can trust the Holy Spirit instead? Who needs worldly wisdom when you have God? Reeves explores these complicated questions and I think has some fantastic responses to offer. So we'll dive into this book in just a little bit more detail. I'll read you a quote from his introduction here. To take scientific expertise seriously is to approach a scientific theory with an open mind, an awareness of one's own lack of knowledge and competence on an issue. One might remain unconvinced by the argument, but a humble approach to the matter will help avoid the problem against which Augustine warned in his commentary on Genesis, damaging the credibility of the Christian faith by claiming to know things on matters about which one is ignorant. As an aside, one of the main arguments in Reeves' book is that if experts within the church mistrust experts outside of the church, then that mistrust will be returned, and this cycle just damages the church's mission. I'll continue to read here. It's too easy to move from the idea that everyone has a right to their own opinion to the idea that everyone is competent to decide for themselves what is true and false. This fosters a lack of humility, irreconcilable with the fruits of the spirit that should mark the Christian life. He expands upon this in a later chapter where he wrote, God has given human the capabilities using our senses and conferring with others using language that make rational deliberation possible, that make science and expertise possible. The Holy Spirit in almost all cases makes use of these normal human capabilities rather than rendering them redundant. And a few sentences later, he writes, we as Christians need other people, both to understand our Bible and our world. And if this wasn't good enough, a few paragraphs later, he adds, and any doctrine of the Holy Spirit that does not find something of value in non-Christian traditions is not thinking creatively enough about how the Holy Spirit works in the world. So hopefully I've convinced you that this book, I think, just has a lot of great wisdom to share with you. He certainly shares wisdom from other great thinkers, such as, such as C.S. Lewis. I'll share this quote with you. Maybe it will haunt you like it has me. Christianity does not replace the technical. When it tells you to feed the hungry, it doesn't give you lessons in cookery. If you want to learn that, you must go to a cook rather than a Christian. The emphasis is original here. So as Lewis is talking and writing to industry workers um, and handy people, he's arguing that their technical expertise is important. So we can take this and say, okay, if we want to feed the hungry, if we want to care for the orphans and the widows and the sick, if we want to share with the poor and if we want to steward our earthly resources, if we want to do all these things that scripture commands, we need experts to help us do this well. Experts in agriculture, education, economics, science, and more. So Reeves and so many of the other authors of these books and others have summarized a lot of reasons why there is mistrust in science. Reasons from conspiracy theories, charismatic leaders, all the way down to the strange nature of scientists, agree, um, <laughs> and this idea that we have to choose between faith and science, like they're somehow mutually exclusive, which they're not. I don't have time to highlight all of these, but I'll just focus on two. The first one, or the first one that I've highlighted here, because some people have experienced discrimination at the hands of scientific researchers and healthcare professionals. Certainly this has happened, and unfortunately it continues to happen. Discrimination such as racism still exists today. So we need to still keep doing this good work to improve. We can do this by listening, acknowledging, apologizing, and doing the work needed to simply make the world a better place, a more equitable place. We've made improvement in this area. There is so much more still to make. 
Another reason that I wanted to highlight here is biomedical commercialization. Certainly, this can make some people uneasy, I understand. Some industries, such as the pharmaceutical industry, does profit from people's pain, does capitalize on cures. I won't discuss that deeply today, um, but I will refer you to some other resources that I think are just um, great, ways, great ways where you can read about this further. John LaMatina has written about this quite a bit, the pharmaceutical industry. His latest book published just last year in 2022 is entitled Pharma and Profits, so I recommend it to you. I also recommend a past prov talk to you. Jeremy Funk, a few years ago, spoke about a Christian case for accepting capitalism, and I think that there's some wisdom there that we can apply um, here as well. So to end, I want to summarize a variety of reasons of why we should trust in science. Because common sense alone is not enough to understand the world around us. Because there's too much knowledge for any one person to know. Because scientists and scientific institutions display these dimensions of trustworthiness. Because these institutions train, test, monitor, and certify experts and hold them to account. Because institutions bring together diverse thinkers, and that's just the best approach to tackle the complex problems that we face. And I know what you're thinking. These experts and institutions aren't perfect. I acknowledge that. No industry is perfect, and science certainly isn't. But trusting them is better than the alternatives, being either trusting no one or trusting non-experts. Because if we mistrust all experts, then society would come to a standstill. And because nature reveals God. And if we study nature, do science, we can encounter God. And certainly many Christians who are also scientists can attest to that. And lastly, because the Holy Spirit bestows wisdom, not technical expertise, but the Holy Spirit, as it helps us to discern God's will, can help us use our technical expertise for good, for God's glory. Thank you.